Aha, you thought you got rid of me. Okay, a couple of announcements. VBS, that stands for Vacation Bible School. June 20th through 24th, 6 to 8.30 p.m. right here. Um, you must be registered to attend or your kids or whatever. Uh, it's open to all. The space is limited. And we have posters and invite sheets back there to spread throughout our community. Um, the VBS servants meeting is today, immediately following service. So if that's not if, what was it? That's not if you're... Teacher's assistance, yeah, right. Okay, uh, Friday, 7 p.m., you turn for Christ, Bible study and service. It's a wonderful, good time. It's open to everyone, so y'all come Friday night. And then finally, the offering. We don't pass a plate around here at Calvary Chapel, but we do have offering boxes by the by the back doors. Um, and just as God puts on your heart, as God uh, provides, as God guides, God provides. There you go. I haven't done announcements in a while, so. And please direct your attention to the video. Please watch video. It says, please watch video. <sighs> okay. He's lame, isn't he? <laughs> it was me. I made the bulletin. Yeah. Um, okay, you, youth, you may exit the, the sanctuary. Go to your own sanctuary. Go to your own place. Get out of here. Um, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 7, and I'm going to pray for the message. Father, I, I, man, I tell you, I come up here, and my heart is just filled. Um, my spirit is lifted, my, my, my Lord, to, to be able to come before you, each and every one of us, to come before you and uh, be humbled by your word, to be brought before it, Lord, to, uh, to, to have it expose our hearts, our spirits, and... And Lord, to show us, Father, that uh, <laughs> even even the ones that we lift up, the heroes of the faith, as we call them, are just as imperfect as we are, uh, just as human, just as frail and fallible. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that even in the lessons that you give us, uh, Father, you also reveal how much we needed you, how much we need you every every moment. We just pray that you open all these things up to us today. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, we're in Acts chapter 7. Um, you know, and, and it's like, I don't know, I, I struggle with it sometimes because, you know, you're supposed to start with some really cool, pithy story and stuff that gets people into it. And, you know, and, and I just fail at that so many times. And, um, you know, and it, uh, partly because it almost seems put on and fake to me. Uh, when instead I'd rather share that there are times when I make promises to people, when I make promises, I make promises to my children, I've made promises to my wife, to other people, and I don't keep them. Um, you know, I might not say I promise every time, and I think that gives me an out, right? Well, I never said I really would. I just said if I could, and, you know, and I, and I make all kinds of excuses, but um, it's one of those things where, you know, I said it, so why didn't I do it? Um and it's really convicting, but it also kind of reminds me as we get into this and as I look at this, and, and you know, because you and I, we hold people to their promises. And when they don't meet them, uh, the way that we think about them, the way that we look at them becomes different. It really does. Um, oftentimes, when we break ours, oh, man, i got a million excuses for when I do it. But I will take none for when they do it. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it becomes one of those things where it's like, if I am to be judged so harshly or judged so harshly because of promises that are made, how should God be judged who is the giver of all good things, the one who makes these promises? And how should I look at his promises that he makes? Um, and, and that's not really the focus of this story today, but it's one of the things that really got me because Stephen's going to use these great men of faith that, that, you know, if you go and read the, the, the hall of faith, as we like to call it in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, and all of these guys, none of these guys, I mean, Abraham, the, the, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that guy, right? You know, he's, he's in the book, right? And he got nearly none of it. And yet, 
you know, he comes and he doesn't look at a promise as something that, you know, is to be delivered in the way that he thinks it is, even though he does challenge God at one point in time. And we're going to kind of look at that a little bit. But he holds fast to the faith that no matter what God promises, he'll see it through to the end. And that's one of the things that Stephen's going to point out to these guys in a message that we've entitled. Um, you know, I'm, I'm calling the whole chapter. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter today. You're OK. All right. You're going to make it to lunch. You're good. Um, but I'm calling the whole chapter his story or history from Acts chapter 7. And today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16 in a message I've entitled The Patriarchs. So look with me at Acts chapter 7, um, beginning with verse 1. The high priest said, are these things so? And he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Verse 7, And the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot, begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. So let's look at this section right now, and we'll just call this Abraham. Um, you know, in verse one, one of the things that the high priest says is, are these things so? Are these things true? You know, are these guys saying truth? Um, and that comes from Acts chapter six, verses probably like you could probably just do eight through, uh, you know, 15. Uh, verse eight, Stephen, uh, uh, in, in the chapter right before this one, Acts chapter six, verse eight, Stephen, full of faith and power did great wonders and signs among the people. Um, and then you see in verse 11, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And we, you know, we kind of looked at that and saw how technically, according to the faith that they were holding on to at the time, he kind of was being blasphemous, right? You know, he kind of was saying these things, but they really engineered everything to speak against him. And then in... Um, Verse 13, they set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. You know, and we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. That's not a lie. It really isn't. Um, and, and, you know, so they are engineering everything to get people worked up and to get everybody worked up and to get everybody going. And it's a, a funny thing, again, as we had talked about, that when he comes in, here's Stephen, right? And he's a nobody, dude. He's a table servant. He's not one of the 12, right? Remember the gang of the 12? That's what they called the apostles throughout it, you know? And, it, and they actually began to be called the 12 as a group, as, as a whole. And Stephen, he's a deacon, a servant, a table servant. No, he's he's not even a quote unquote deacon. He can't vote Peter out of the church. You know what I'm saying? Right. In in terms of how everybody tends to think of deacons nowadays, he's just a servant. He's just, you know, hey, I'm just here to make sure the widows get their food. That's it. And yet, guys, and this is the thing. Each and every one of us in here could be a Stephen is a Stephen. You can affect the world around you. And Stephen, he stands before this man and he hears the same things that Jesus did. You know, what is truth? Is this truth? And you and I, as we come into this and we begin to see what Stephen says, his response, again, not a defense. Not, he's not defending himself, which you and I tend to do. You know, if somebody's like, you know, so everybody's coming against you. Everybody's accusing you. The enemy's accusing you. Your own mind is accusing you. You're even maybe our own sense of guilt. And here, you know, when this is faced, Stephen doesn't begin to say, well, let me tell you how good I really am. Or let me tell you. He doesn't do that. He looks at all these men who are sitting there 
who basically want him to do what they want to do. And he says, brothers, fathers, you know, he shows them respect. I'm one of you guys. I'm one of you. Listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And what's funny when you read that is one of the things you see when you see that a lot of people go back to, um, I think it's, uh, what, Genesis chapter, in the Genesis chapter 11 and, and Genesis chapter 12, right? And when you go back there, one of the things that you see is it, it almost seems to intone that Abraham heard the call while they, while they were in Haran, okay? And then after his father had died, he left. But if you read the text, it really doesn't read that way because a lot of the text, especially in the Old Testament, it's not one of those things of, well, verse 8 comes after verse 7, so verse 7 having preferred verse 8. You and I, as, as people who live in America and things like that, we tend to think in a linear fashion. But that's not how, you know, the Asiatic cultures do things, right? For them, it's not A, B, C, D. It's A, B, one, three, you know, and it's like, that, you know, they don't think the same way that you and I do. It's the same thing with like Hebrew poetry and stuff like that. It's beautiful, but they say the same thing 18 times. And you and I, by the third time, are going, oh, this has got to stop, right? But for them, it's beautiful, and they love it, right? But we come into this, and here, you know, Stephen's basically telling us, notice, do any of the guys go, you're wrong, Stephen, stop it. Right? And these are Pharisees. These are doctors of theology. And they don't stop him. They don't say, no, Stephen, you're, you're off here. They don't do that. Okay? He's saying exactly what is right. So what does that mean to you and I? You're like, okay, what's the biggie? Right? I don't understand. What, what, why are you even saying this, Robert? Because I want to make a point to you. One of the things that Stephen points out to them, why would he just use Abraham? Just to make him feel guilty? Right. Or just to kind of get them where they're like, you know, thinking about these things. No, because what is this thing about Abraham that we see here? What was the order, the call of Abraham? You know, he effectively says it right here. Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. So what does Abraham do? He goes from Ur of the Chaldees. Right. And he goes 50 miles up the river to Haran. With his dad, his brothers, and everybody. So he begins to be obedient, kind of like we do sometimes. God will say, hey, you go do this, you go do that. Hey, I want you to do this. And we go, yeah, but, right? There's always that but that creeps in, that always that thing that I want to do it, God, but sometimes it's just hard. And we come into this, and not only does Abraham, and God appeared to him. You understand. And Abraham, you know, when he tells him this, he's telling these guys this, your father, Abraham, who was an idolater, we know in Joshua it tells us, he was an idolater, and God called him. Abraham didn't earn it. Abraham wasn't worthy of it. God chose him. He called, and Abraham answered. But very imperfectly, right? Leave your family. Leave your stuff. Come. And Abraham begins to go, and he makes it all the way to Haran. And they stay there for, you know, I, I can't remember how many years right now. I want to say it's like 75 years until his dad dies. And, and, and it kind of reminded me of that, you know, of when Christ was walking and a, and a person says, I want to follow you, but let me go bury my father first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. You come and follow me. And the guy went away sad. Right. Because Jesus isn't into excuses with us. Jesus isn't into these things where it's like, OK, you do your own thing. And when you're ready, I'll be here. Right. He's like, you know, isn't it better that you would lose your entire life to save it? And, and it's a strange thing that we see here when he does this. And, and eventually Abraham does obey just as it is. But look what God has to do to tear him apart. Because even when he goes into the land of Canaan, he takes Lot with him, okay? And it just, it kind of blows my mind as we do this because 
he says, you know, here, God did this. You know, get out of your country uh, from your relatives. Come to a land I will show you. And he says in verse 4, he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, dwelt in Haran from there. When his father was dead, he moved to this land in which you now dwell. The reason you're here is because Abraham was obedient. And for many of us, you know, a lot of the reasons that we're here and the things that are going on is because we were obedient to some form of calling. We may not be walking perfectly in it. Abraham didn't, but yet he's in the book, right? Not because he was perfect, but because he obeyed. You know, Abraham was not perfect in his obedience, and he reminds these men who look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the fathers of the faith, the patriarchs, the one who gave us everything that we have, you know, and, and they include Moses in that. But a lot of times you and I, we come into these things and we have to understand there's none of us perfect. There's none of us that does everything right in the perfect way. And, and if we understand that, if we come into this and we understand that Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness, what did he believe? He believed in the promises God made. He believed God would raise his son from the dead if that's what it took. And you and I, when we come into these things, you know, I, I, I can't just look at what I have right in front of me. I've got to look at what God's doing in my life. And as you come into this, one of the other things we kind of see here, and, and it kind of moved me as we see this, because if you were to turn, do me a favor, hold your place here in Acts chapter 7. Turn to Acts chapter 22. Because remember we discussed who's here at this particular occasion? Paul, right. So Paul's here at this particular occasion. And, and, and I just think it's really interesting as we see this. Acts chapter 22. All right. So Stephen, when he's questioned by the council, says, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia before he began, dwelt in Haran. And then we go to Acts chapter 22. And the mob in Jerusalem now has Paul, much like they did Stephen. And Paul, you can see, was affected. You know, he was affected by what happened with Stephen. He was moved. Because what does he say in chapter 22, verse 1? Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they, all, they kept all the more silent. And then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you are all this day. I'm one of you. I'm one of you. And he starts out the same way that Stephen did, man. And you got to know Paul's thinking, I'm getting ready to die. This is awesome. Right? Not that he was going to die, but that he was blessed to be able to give his life for the faith. He even goes on in verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest. And then we get down to verse 7, and he says, as he was, you know, verse 6, as he was traveling you know, and came near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven shone around. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it was Jesus. And he, just like Abraham, was visited by God and he answered. He gave us most of our New Testament. And, you know, you can read that story later as you go turn back to chapter 7. But it's one of the things that we read this as we see this that you and I need to understand that what Stephen is doing here is being led by the Holy Spirit and it is impacting people. We're going to see later on in the book of Acts where more and more priests are coming to the faith. More and more contentions begin to happen because people want to start mixing up, you know, what God is doing in Jesus Christ with the law. And it begins to, you know, people start knocking heads. But here they are brought into the land in which you now dwell. Verse 5, and, gave, and God gave him no inheritance in it. Even though he said, I'm going to give you this land, right? But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and its descendants after him. And again, we talked about how in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham goes to God. He literally, you know, he, you know, again, 
Abraham's not perfect. He's just like you and me. Sometimes you and I, we go to God and we're like, God, you said A, and it's still just B right now. What's going on? Right? Abraham, in Genesis chapter 15, he goes to God and he said, you said I was going to have the descendants like this. I was going to have all this land. I was going to do all this. Where's it at? Right? And then God makes a covenant with Abraham. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And when he called Abraham, notice he did He just said, go to Canaan. Right? Unspecified, unspecific. I'm going to give it to you and your descendants. You're going to have all these things. And yet, you know, he died. And this is the thing. He died. Abraham died without owning a single piece of land. I think he owned an altar and a tomb. A place where he could worship and a place where his body could be laid when he died. It, right? That's it. And did his descendants get it? Well, yes and no, right? And that's one of the things Stephen begins to point out. He's like, you know, this is a God thing. It's not a you thing. It's not an us thing. It's not a law thing. It's a God thing. This is God. And when God makes promises, sometimes we think about them a bit differently than He makes them. You know. It's one of those things like sometimes when you and I will say, you know, I, I really love God. But do we? But when he says he loves us, he shows it in everything and in every way that he does. But did his descendants get it? Ah, verse 6. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Abraham... I'm going to give you these sons, and I'm going to make them slaves, right? I'm going to take everything from them. I'm going to put them, I'm going to put them in this foreign land where everybody's going to hate them, right? Just so I can set them free and show everybody that I'm really doing this. Verse 7, the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. After that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. I mean, how hard is that? Sometimes you and I... We, we think all the promises of God are supposed to be, you know, so perfect, so good, so right. But yet sometimes when you and I begin to walk with God and begin to walk in him in, in obedience and things get harder. And then we start going, wait, what? What's going on? Did God really call me into this? Because this is hard. Shouldn't it be easy if God is calling? I didn't sign up for this. Right. If I had known this from the beginning, why didn't you? You know, and, and again, you and I have to understand as they come into this. He is basically telling Abraham all. And, and remember, Abraham doesn't even have son number one when God says all these things. I'm going to give you. And then when he gets it, he gets one. Right. It's a wonder that he didn't name him sand. Right. Just to try and fit into the prophecy. I'm going to name you sand because he said he'd give me grains of sand, you know. All right. Call him Adam. Right. What does Adam mean? Dirt man, that's right. So, but he didn't name him Adam. So, anyway, so Abraham, it says in verse 8, Abraham in verse 8, uh, he says he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs, and it's implied that, again, they received that covenant as well. Um, so he's like, okay, you're going to do this, and I'm going to give you, and, and here's your... Here's your engagement ring, <laughs> right? Circumcision, that's the promise. You know, we're going to cut a piece of your flesh off and you're going to bleed and there is no way on earth that you can get away with saying that you ain't mine. Yeah, you know, it's that same thing when we put our rings on, right? She's not looking at me. She's reading her Bible. When we put those rings on is your mind. And I'm yours. It's that sign of ownership. And he does it through, you know, that reproductive system and says, mine, 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 mine. And he does the same thing with us. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, he tells the people, the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. So 
even in Deuteronomy, God begins to say it's a heart thing. It's not just a sign in the flesh. That's just for you to know that I'm in here. Right? God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. What did Jesus say when they said, what does it mean to be a follower of God? He said, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. In Romans 2, 28 and 29, Paul says, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You see, and and that's that thing when he circumcises our heart. we We don't become this thing where we've got to follow rules and we've got to do these things, though we want to. Why? Because it's in our heart. Because he's changed our hearts. We don't follow the rules so that we can earn or be worthy of salvation. It's because it's in here. He's placed it inside of us. And just as if all we do is act the part, if we just do it on the outside, Deuteronomy, Romans, you know, because you can be circumcised on the outside. Does that make you a Jew? Does eating a donut make you a cop? No, right? Yeah. It, it, if it's just on the outside, it's useless. You and I, when we come to God, it's got to be something on the inside. It's got to be something in the heart. And people that are changed in their heart change on the outside. It's not vice versa. And then we go from looking at Abraham and we see the promise and everything that he's doing. And and now he says, okay, this is how everything started in the most imperfect way that one could. But yet still God did it. And now he says, now, now let's look at Israel in verses nine or or verses uh, nine through 16. So he says, let's look at Israel now. And he says in the patriarchs. So here. All these people come up, all these people are doing these things, and the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. It's like, okay, right? What does that mean? What does that mean? And and he comes into it, and again, There's all of the parallels, all of the shadows, all the types that we see in what Jesus is doing here. Um, And I'm not going to have you turn because there's just too much to go through, but you can begin in Genesis chapter 37 and kind of see what's going on with Joseph and these guys. But the funny thing is, is with Joseph, okay, it's like, you know, you get one of those things in your head and you're like, oh, it's pretty cool. And then when you try to explain it to somebody, it just it sounds like algebra, right? It, okay. <laughs> uh, and algebra is difficult to me. I don't math. Me and math, we got in a fight when I was a kid and never got along after that. Um, but, you know, so I, I, I make those correlations. But here's the thing. What happens with Joseph, right? Joseph, he, he has a vision. And God says... You're going to save your people. Okay? So Joseph reveals himself to his people. What are his people? His 11 crazy, messed up family. Right? His 11 brothers. Two of them, mass murderers. Right? He's got four different moms all living in the same house. You think your family's bad? Right? And Joseph gets told by God, I'm going to make you boss of these guys. You're going to be responsible for them. And he goes to his family, and what do they do? They reject him. And his father, who received his inheritance through deception, is deceived by his own sons, by Israel. Because remember, Israel, even if you go look at where he's talking about there, he doesn't, he doesn't, God doesn't even call him Israel in the Scriptures at this point in time. Even though he's already given him the name, he says Jacob. 
supplanter, heel catcher. Not warrior of God, but the guy that stole stuff, right? And he, you know, Joseph is rejected by the nation. Israel fools itself because the brothers lie to the father and they give the son of promise. They give the son of promise to an enemy to get rid of him. All right? To pull him out of the picture. So he's rejected by the nation. And you know, nobody fights like brothers, right? And even brothers and sisters sometimes. But brothers, man, they know how to fight. They know how to fight. I can remember a time where we actually, I, I, was trying to, I was trying to be the magnanimous father, right? To be the good dad, to teach my sons um, what violence was about. And they were going after each other. I can't even remember what it was about. It was so stupid, right? And, and so I brought them together, and I was like, okay, guys, sit down. And I said, you really want to punch your brother? You really want to hit him? And, 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 and I was trying to do that guilt thing, right, that why would you want to hurt somebody? I was like, you really want to? Well, go ahead and hit him. Without a second's hesitation, my son Carl Wham! I mean, he waylaid Alex. And I was just like, oh, that went so wrong. All right? So, but the fact is, is brothers will, I mean, they will kill you right in front of your own family. Okay? And, and here, he goes to his brothers, who are already jealous, who are already doing those things. And, and he says, eh, yeah, God wants me to be your boss. Right? So, Right. And here's the thing, Jesus comes to his brothers and he says, I've come to deliver you. And what did his brothers do? They delivered him to someone that wasn't even family to get rid of him. You know, so we see these shadows, we see these tights, we see these everythings. But here, you and I, we see the story of this Joseph who was obedient, who's following after God, who goes to God and he's being taken to Egypt, and we see it as a story of deliverance, but you and I also have to understand that God's fulfilling the prophecy at the same time. This beautiful story of Joseph is also a horrible story of Israel about to go and become enslaved by a foreign nation for four centuries, right? <laughs> you know, it's crazy, man. It's so beautiful, yet so horrible at the same time. It's the same thing as the cross. It is so horrible. It is so painful. It is so agonizing. But it is so beautiful at the same time because in that cross is our forgiveness. In that cross is the payment for our sins. Verse 11, Now famine and a great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out his fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Um, and for God to engineer and to have these guys come, he doesn't force the hand of Jacob or his family. He actually creates an environment in which obedience becomes necessary. Right. God, he's not, you know, we're not these robots that he just makes do what we want to do. Jacob could have stayed there. You know, they could have starved to death, but they made a decision because famine, starvation will make people do drastic things. In a place that they, you know, know from dad. Remember when great grandpa went to Egypt and man, there was trouble there when Abraham went to Egypt. And here. It's, it's just funny because they go to do fealty to Egypt. These sons of Abraham who delivered a son to the same people. Yeah, and, and it's that reminiscent somewhat to me of when Israel had Christ there and could have delivered him. But and, and you know, Pilate was ready to let him go. But what did Israel say? Kill him. We have no king but Caesar. And now the brothers come to do fealty to the same kingdom that they believe has taken him, that they have delivered him to. So the second time it says, look what it says now. 
The second time Joseph was made known to his brothers and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. I don't think that this isn't done on purpose. Though we know if you go read the story, the first time they come, all they think is that he's, you know, just the prime minister of Egypt. He's just, you know, the right-hand man of the Pharaoh, right? So as far as they know, you know, he's just another Egyptian, okay? And the second time they come, he's revealed to them. But what's going to happen the second time that Jesus comes? He's going to be revealed for who he is, that he has all power, authority, and everything to completely save. And and again, uh, the, the, the shadows and types that we see here of everything going on, I really don't think is lost on these men who know the Bible so well and who know why Stephen is there. Stephen is there representing Christ. He is representing Jesus Christ. And he says the one that was delivered up became an authority over all things. Only one was above him, and that was Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was controlled by God. The second time. Man, this is wild. The second time Joseph is revealed as the Savior of Israel. Verse 14, then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. Seventy-five people. Seventy-five family members. All the kids and the cousins and the this and the that. Now, in some of your Bibles, it may even have a note in there that in the original text back in Genesis, it was 70. And there's all kinds of weird arguments about this, about the timing of Abraham. But I can tell you that most of the arguments are moot and they're a point that he you know, shouldn't even be brought out and fought about. Um, because whether it's 70 or 75, the fact is, is that they were brought out. Okay? They were brought out. They were delivered and they were brought to a place where they, you know, where God has them. And, you know, it's also another thing for me. It's one of those things of, you know, and, and I don't mean to make any fun, anybody feel guilty for having anything. Please understand that. Because I believe that God does provide us with things. But when God, you know, they have in their minds and in what they see as the perfect setup, right? Brothers in charge. Free land, free grazing, right? We basically have this beautiful town. It's almost like having a beautiful country village in the middle of a city, surrounded by wealth and prosperity. But what they don't know and understand when this is happening, it is the beginning of a chain that is being placed upon them. You guys, we can't look at all good things as good things. You know, I've seen people get beautiful homes, beautiful cars, beautiful things, and it becomes a chain to them. They stop fellowshipping with people. They stop hanging out. They stop doing things, right? And, and it becomes all about keeping the things rather than, you know, worshiping the God that they're supposed to be worshiping. You know, and again, as he's saying these things, none of these guys are arguing about whether this is orthodox or not. You know, because some people say something like, well, you know, it was 70 back in Genesis, and he's saying 75, and, you know, I've read scholars that say, well, the 75 was from the Samaritan version of the Bible or from this version or from the Septuagint. You know, but the fact is, is, you know, all you got to do is do the counts weird. Because remember, you know, we have two genealogies in the Scriptures. One is from the line of Joseph, and the other one is from the line of Mary. Right? Both are still lineage of Jesus Christ. One from the legal side and one from the physical side. You know, we, we can't you know, think in linear ways like that because they end up in the same place as Abraham. Chapter 7, verse 16. They were carried back to Shechem, laid in a tomb that Abraham brought, bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of of Shechem. They were laid in a tomb. 
And see, that's also another thing for us to know and understand as we begin to read this. And he's reminding them of this, too. You know, great Joseph in a tomb, great Abraham in a tomb, great Isaac in a tomb, Jacob tomb. The deliverance that we see and that we understand that we experience in this world is temporary. All the good things that we think we experience, all the good things that we think we have are temporary. But the experience, the freedom and the deliverance that we get in Jesus Christ is eternal, guys. And if we don't teach ourselves that and if we don't teach our children that, then they will begin to think that the idea of being blessed by God is by the things that we have in this world. And we can't look at that as so temporary. That's such a temporary mind. And Stephen, as he's talking about all these things, again, is unchallenged in his observation. None of the guys are going, no, 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 I contend. I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't, you know, you're wrong on this point. You're wrong on that point. You know, they, they know Abraham was an idolater chosen by God. He was called. He believed, you know, he didn't, he didn't just believe that God would follow these promises. He literally believed that his son, who he was told was the son of promise, that if he sacrificed him, God would raise him from the dead. And he obeyed to the point of being willing to give that up. I mean, you know, what kind of faith is that? What kind of belief is that? It is the kind of faith that saves. And that you and I need to understand and kind of get from. Um, He had only glimpsed the promise. He only had a bare shadow of the promise of what, what was to be seen. One kid, no land, and yet he believed God. For all of it. And the Bible tells us it was accounted to him as righteousness. In closing, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, beginning with verse 17, says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, (laughs) of whom it was said, And Isaac, your seed, singular, shall be called. You know, God is telling him, that the deliverer of Israel will come from this. Verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What does that mean? That means back when he told Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go sacrifice him. In Abraham's mind, his son was dead. My son's dead. How many days did it take to get there? Three. How many days was Jesus in a tomb? Three. And it says to Abraham, his son was dead. Hmm. And he knew he could raise him from the dead if he did it. And three days after that, his son was delivered. God provided a sacrifice. And his son was now alive. And you and I, as we read these things, we have to understand. Verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worship, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Joseph said, you know what? We're here, but God's going to fulfill a promise. And when it happens, do this. You know, he didn't just look at what was right then. He knew what God had promised. Israel, when given a Savior, killed him by handing him over to a pagan nation. And though not outright stated, truly, Joseph really is a type of Christ. And and as we look at these things and we see everything that Stephen is presenting, it is all presented to point at Jesus Christ. And that's the thing as you and I come into this, when we begin to read these things, it's not just a history lesson. It really is his story. It really is God has been doing this from the beginning. Every single bit of this is about Jesus Christ. And guys, you and I have this this beautiful thing where I don't have to depend on me for my salvation. I don't need to depend on you. I depend on him. 
And then he joins us together as a body, as a whole. And, and, and it's just a beautiful thing to me that, you know, as dysfunctional as the families were that we see in the Scripture, this family, just as dysfunctional. You know? There, I, I have, I've not met a perfect person, much less a perfect believer in my entire life. You know? You know something? And I met Chuck Smith. So, not a single one of us, man. Not a single one of us. Uh, each and every one of us needed Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us was lost, condemned, given up. But there was one who did everything he could to save us and brought us in to this kingdom. You know, I, I just encourage you as you begin to look at this and, and read ahead, man, read ahead into what's coming. Um, because, you know, he's going to go into the story not just of God delivering Israel by Moses, but Moses giving everything, and then Israel rebelling against God. And he's going to talk about the true tabernacle. Stephen is not just beginning this big, long history lesson. It's all pointing at Jesus Christ. And for you and I, that's one of the things that we need to come into, come to know and understand. And all of this is about him. And that, that we don't have to struggle, we don't have to strive. We just have to walk in Him. You know, not look for perfection in ourselves or anyone else. Walk in Him. And see what He does. You know, he is at perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon Him. Not on our circumstances, not on what we think God needs to be doing or should be doing, but on Him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now, Lord, and we thank you so much just for this time to be able to come together, to be able to worship you, to come after you. And Lord, as we as we give you this moment and we give you this time, we pray, Father, that you would help us to see, Lord, not just what it is you want to do with us, but what it is that you want us to do. Uh, Lord, you you call us. Lord, not to act like disciples, but to be disciples. You tell us to be circumcised in our hearts. Lord, for it to be an internal thing. And, and you have made it clear what a disciple does, how a disciple lives. Lord, in the book of Ephesians, we are told to be children of light, not of darkness. Father, help us. Help us to walk after you, to imitate our Father. To walk in love. To walk in holiness. Walk in the truth of what you've given us. Not as perfect people, Lord, because we can't, not here. But as those that are trying to walk behind our Lord. To follow after our Savior. To be his disciples. To see what he does and then do it ourselves. Help us, Lord, to do these things. To live for you. To understand, Lord, that this life is not all there is. But it is all that we have right now. Help us to walk in it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you would, please rise. And we'll do the benediction. Um, for those of you that uh, weren't able to make this past Wednesday, um, we're going to do a communion immediately following the service. So basically, we're going to release, and we're going to ask all you chatty people. Notice how I looked over there. No, I'm messing with you. But if you weren't able to come Wednesday uh, to take communion and you'd like to take communion today, please stay right after, you know, right after I release. We're going to ask everybody to kind of break and we'll meet right here and we'll do communion uh, with those that couldn't be here this Wednesday. So let's do that benediction. All right. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance 
upon the end give thee peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Get out. Ha, ha, ha.